Well, I'd like to welcome you all, you all to the 2009 Nye Lecture. Uh, we'll be honoring Dr. Larry Hinsman um, today. Um, before we do that, we're going to also honor uh, the next generation of scientists with the Outstanding Young uh, Chrysphere Scientist Award. Um, Georg Kaiser will present this award to this year's recipient. It is very much like last year. Uh, there is first an announcement of a young scientist, and then the name is given for a person that is not young anymore. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I, I am almost tempted to now present Dr. Thomas Mölk. He is the new. Uh, he is the young scientist. I have to present. I have the honor to present. Uh, not in German, but in my real mother tongue, which is a kind of a very strange uh, dialect from somewhere inside the mountains of, uh, of the Alps, because uh, the chairman here understands me in this language. And so each time when we meet, we say servus to each other, and then we continue a conversation in, in this kind of very strange German. But I, I won't do so, because most of the uh, audience would be excluded from that. Uh, Back to Thomas Mölk. Thomas Mölk has come into, so to say, my life and our, our research group's uh, life when he uh, did his master thesis, and his master thesis was uh, on, uh, on trying to explain what the reasons were for a very strange uh, re recession pattern of ice in the Ruwenzori Mountains between Uganda and Congo. And he did this in a very nice way. He was very straightforward, and, and uh, he did a very skilled and a very perfect master thesis. But then, for reasons which I do not extend here, I became very, very interested in Kilimanjaro, in, in the ice on top of Kilimanjaro. And I knew I would not be able to do it on, by myself. I had a lot, of, a lot of obligations by then, so I was looking for somebody who I thought would be the right person for it. And my impression was that whoever I would approach, he will immediately or she will immediately say, yes, I come with you. Uh, that was different with Thomas. Thomas said, yes, it's highly interesting, but I don't know. He had got offered a training position for a, a civil aircraft uh, pilot training by the Austrian Airlines, and that was his, so to say, his, his life uh, schedule by then. And it took him actually a couple of months until he was convinced that, and I got some support from outside forcings, which I also do not explain here. Uh, finally, he came on board or he came into my office and said, yes, let's do that. And so we did, and then we just uh, wrote a proposal on, on this scientific project, which we were through within a couple of months very quickly. And then there is this waiting period. You know, you, you have submitted something which you think it's the most beautiful thing in Earth, and then you wait for months and months and months. And uh, Thomas did something very interesting. He sat down, got in contact with Doug Hardy from Massachusetts, who had already collected data from Kilimanjaro. And by the day we have got this proposal accepted, he had been out already with three papers, in very nice journals, Journal of, uh, journal of uh, 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 sorry, yeah, no matter, three really high-ranked uh, papers, and that's quite a time ago. And uh, he had also, he was also due with his PhD, so uh, he put me in a kind of a difficult situation because the money we finally got was, did not foresee a, PhD, uh, a postdoc position, but only a PhD position, so we, agreed that we just start, and I, I wish every one of you can have this experience to start a project with all the tasks which you have promised to fulfill, already fulfilled. So you have just an open floor and you can do whatever you like. It's great, and that, uh, that shadows also into the next project, and, and we are still living from that. So Thomas started as a PhD, and as such he immediately developed into, into a very uh, independent uh, research scientist. He, uh, he st first started in, in, in just trying to, to uh, do conceptual modeling on what the glaciers on Kilimanjaro are like and how they are driven by different climate drivers. 
And then uh, he did also field work, of course, which is a quite of a challenging thing at six, almost 6,000 meters in the tropical uh, mid-troposphere. And he immediately understood that just going into sophisticated mass balance modeling is not enough. There are drivers there which are only to be understood if he, or if somebody goes into the atmospheric sciences from meteorology, boundary, boundary layer meteorology to large scale or mesoscale and then large scale climate dynamics. And so he didn't hesitate to just go step by step and do all that. And by doing so, I think he really opened, uh, on, on the front of the cryospheric research, he opened the field of, of uh, multi-method, multi-scale approaches, which I think will lead or can lead our science into uh, just new, new levels of understanding. So Thomas is also a great field work, a great team worker. Uh, I experienced that uh, from the beginning when he was just a student, we had to supervise him, but immediately he went into, into a kind of a social component in our group, and then he also extended immediately in a person who helped me supervise the others, and he did more than, than anyone else open our windows and our doors to the world, to the outside world and to the to uh, science is not only focusing on cryospheric, uh, cryospheric sciences alone. Uh, so this is something he really brought into our group and he really does still. Uh, so he has a lot of corporations around the world which are very much to the benefit of what we do in our group. Uh, he also he, he not only did perform science, he also, all of a sudden, I got an email with an attachment and that was a theater play. It was highly interesting to read. It, it took me the, that evening not working on science, but uh, reading this, this play. It was highly interesting. He also composes music. He writes lyrics and, and prose, I think a little bit less than before because he is now very much into professional science. Uh, to make the whole story short, uh, the last years, or this year's 2009 publications from the, International, uh, from the Journal of Glaciology to the Journal of Climatology to the, uh, Journal of the, uh, to the Quaternary Journal of Royal Meteorological Society just reflects and mirrors his broadness, his uh, high spectrum, this broad spectrum of approaches and skills. So Thomas, I am very happy and I'm very glad, glad and uh, you allow me to, uh, to be also a little bit proud to uh, introduce you to this uh, award giving and I will just hand over now uh, to Jason Box to fulfill this or to bring this to a happy end. I hope this is what, just one benchmark on a very promising uh, uh, career that, that I hope I can accompany you for a little while. Just a few words, I want to thank the Cryosphere Focus Group for this recognition and the National Snow and Ice Data Center for sponsoring the award. I'm really honored. There are many people who have helped me over the past few years, so I would like to take the time to emphasize three of them. Georg Kasa, who really formed me as a student, as you just heard as well as Nicholas Cullen from the University of Otago and Douglas Hardy from the University of Massachusetts. I also want to acknowledge funding from the Austrian Science Foundation, Kurt Kaffee and Matthias Wuy who wrote supporting letters, my working group at Innsbruck and the wonderful people behind the scenes by which I mean my family and my friends and my last word is that the work over the past five or six years on Kilimanjaro was truly intense. But on top of that, it was also just amazing fun to study the ice fields on Kilimanjaro and tropical climate change. So I hope everybody can have fun doing science. Thanks again, I really appreciate it. Congratulations, Thomas. Well, we're really here today to, for this keynote session, 
in which we recognize the prodigious accomplishments of Dr. Larry Hinsman with the Nye Lecture. Let me describe um, the significance of, of John Nye. John Nye, um, who is John Nye? I'll attempt to briefly summarize. John Nye is a cryospheric science pioneer, currently a professor emeritus at University of Bristol in the UK. Nye planted intellectual seeds widely in topics in cryosphere in their infancy. Let me uh, list some of these. Uh, John Nye developed a new theory in the early 1950s that ice deformed irrecoverably. Nye applied the new ice rheology theory with success in predicting glacier behavior, including a new science of surging glaciers. What is today commonly referred to as Glenn's flow law is more appropriately named the Glenn Nye flow law that remains in widespread use today. Nye further studied water flow in ice more than 50 years ago, a topic that's today still receiving critical attention. Nye made other pioneering work in investigating dynamics at the bed of glaciers. So-called Nye channels are those uh, formed in the glacier bed in the ice, in contrast to Ruthlisberger channels that form um, in the overlying ice. Nye channels are in the underlying uh, rock. Like John Nye, uh, Larry Hinsman is a pioneer and has made contributions to cryosphere science. Um, Dr. Mark Therese uh, will introduce um, Larry Hinsman. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be able to introduce Larry. Uh, many of you already know Larry, of course. Uh, he's, of course, the director of the International Arctic Research Center at UAF Fairbanks. Now, I've known Larry for many years, probably at least 20 years, I think now, both as a colleague and a friend. I remember once asking him uh, where he came from, and he said, well, nowhere, really. And for someone coming from nowhere, he really has come a long way. Um, he got his bachelor's degree in 1979 at South Dakota State University in soil science and general chemistry. But then it was off to uh, Purdue uh, to get an MS in 1981 in agronomy, of all things. So I suppose this means, along with Larry's many other skills, he knows how to grow good grass. Um, <laughs> then it was <laughs> to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for a PhD in soil physics. Um, and uh, he's been, really been there ever since. That was in 1990. Well, Larry's career has really focused on high latitude hydrology. Within that general field, he's uh, been very broad and interdisciplinary. And that's exactly what you have to be to be addressing these complex issues of Arctic change. Uh, he's always in the field, always doing field work. I've had the pleasure to be in the field with Larry once. Um, he uses a lot of remote sensing, but he also dabbles in what he needs to, atmospheric science, ocean science whatever needs to be done to understand the Arctic as a system. But there's more to Larry than just his science. Uh, he's one of these people who was always there. If there is a committee that needs people, Larry is on that. Uh, if there's a workshop that needs to be led, Larry is always doing his part, always going that extra mile. And he always seems to have a kind word for others. And he lives his life right to the hilt. Um, seems that lately we've lost a lot of our you know, heroes and, uh, and role models. Even Tiger Woods has disappointed. Uh, but if any of you, um, you know, have kids looking for role models, uh, point them in the direction of Larry. And so now really it is my pleasure to present to you Larry Hinsman, not just an outstanding scientist, but a stellar human being. Larry. Well, thanks, Mark and Jason, and for all of you who've come. I, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be here. I think, uh, as I've said to several people, I think they, they really pulled the wrong name out of the hat when I was selected. Um, but I will, uh, I appreciate this, uh, this recognition. I will try to make a, uh, a good presentation today. So I want to uh, acknowledge so many of the, uh, the people who have contributed to this. Arctic research has been blessed with uh, some incredible talent 
and I've been blessed with incredible friends, and so many of these have, uh, have contributed to this presentation and, uh, and many others along the way. I also um, must acknowledge the, uh, the funding sources that we've received over the years. Much of the, the work that I'll present here today has been supported by the uh, National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs, but the uh, NOAA Arctic Research Program and the uh, NASA Cryospheric Program have also made uh, very generous contributions. And I also need to thank the, the many students that have worked with us over the years, students and postdocs, who have really guided me and, and taught me a lot along the way. Hmm. So I've clicked on about everything there is to click on up here. Let's try this one. Oh, there we go. OK, so um, the, uh, the Arctic is, is an incredibly coupled system. The, uh, obviously, we know that the, uh, that the sea ice is dynamically coupled with the atmosphere and the ocean circulation. But, but it's also been shown lately that the, uh, that the sea ice changes. The sea ice has uh, dramatic impacts on the permafrost. And with the uh, changes in permafrost, we see responses in hydrology. And with those changes, we see responses in the vegetation and the carbon flux. And we also see those changes reverberating into the, uh, into the human system. We see the, uh, the people living in the Arctic are very closely connected to the environment. And so all in all, it's a very integrated system. And as we see changes in one component of the system, it really does reverberate throughout the rest of the system. And to understand how the Arctic will respond to a changing climate, we really need to, to quantify these interconnections and to, to, to clarify those, those linkages amongst those components. And I'm going to talk about just a few of those today, but it's really incumbent upon us if we're going to try and project and understand what the future is going to look like in the Arctic or, or any component of the Earth system, we really need to understand and be able to quantify those interconnections. This is a paper that was just published last week in, uh, in JGR Biogeosciences with uh, Jennifer Francis as lead author. And it shows many of the, uh, it, it, it d d carefully describes many of the uh, feedback processes that are ongoing in the hydrologic system in the Arctic. It looks at uh, both the atmospheric, I'm sorry, I can't see it very well from here, but it looks at the uh, atmospheric system, the, oceanograph the ocean system, and the terrestrial system, and quantifies the, or not quantifies, but at least characterizes the interconnections among the system components, and gives us a mechanism to look at how those, those changes in one system, changes in one component of the system, may affect other components of the system, so to allow us to build that understanding and, and perhaps eventually quantify those connections. So today I'm going to talk about many of these, these components um, of the system, and, I, and I'll, I'll just touch on a few of them. I won't go into the detail that, that are described in the paper, but I'll, I'll refer you to that paper. So I'm going to start by, by going back and looking at a, at a longer time scales and, and larger spatial scales. So many of you have, have probably seen this plot over the years. So um, for my colorblind friends, the middle, middle line here is the, uh, is the change in temperature. The scale, for those of you that have a hard time seeing it, goes back in time. So this is today. It goes back in time about half a million years, back to about 400,000 years. So the red line is temperature, and the green line below it is methane and the blue line above it is the CO2. And you can see over the last half million years that the uh, dynamics in temperature have been very closely coupled to the, to the changes in uh, methane concentration, atmospheric methane and atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. The, uh, so you can see we've had five inland glacial periods about every, every 100,000 years. And there, there are several really important things about this plot. So we can see that the, uh, that the CO2 and methane are closely closely coupled to the changes in temperature. But the uh, important thing is that the CO2 and methane somewhat lag the temperature. And so it's not necessarily the CO2 that are driving it, although it play a very important role. But there's something else going on here. The other really important thing about this plot is the, uh, this is the change, the red line in the temperature is a change in where we are from today. And so you can see that uh, over the last half million years, the the temperature has been very stable. So for those of you who can't see the scale, it goes to about minus 8 to about 0 for where we are today. So it's change in temperature. So really, the Earth is an incredibly thermally stable place. 
So for the last half million years, we've only had a change of about eight degrees. People oftentimes um, laugh off the idea of, so we have a two degree change or a four degree change in temperature, what does that mean? Well, you can see if we have a four degree decrease in temperature, we're back in an ice age. So I mean, these, these small temperature changes have a big impact on our planet. The other very important thing is that this is where we are today. These are the concentrations of, of CO2 and methane now. So we're at 1,800 points, parts per billion by volume methane and 375 parts per million concentration of CO2. And so we're essentially off the chart for the last half million years. So these are, uh, those will cause great concern for us. The, uh, we all know that the, uh, that the solar cycle is the main drivers of our climate. And so the, uh, looking back at this, we see that there's, there's um, the main cycles, the main uh, essentially sine waves that are driving our climate are from the eccentricity, which varies on a scale of about 100,000 years, and the obliquity, which varies on a scale of about 41,000 years, and then the precession of the equinoxes, which varies on scales of, uh, of 19 and 23,000 years. So in each of these is essentially a, is a sine wave, and the uh, simplicity of sine waves is we can add them up and essentially we receive another, see another sine wave. Slightly more complex than those, the others, but essentially this is the variation in the radiation that we receive at the top of the atmosphere. And you can see it, it varies from about, about 410 watts per meter squared to about uh, 510 watts per meter squared. So it varies by about 100 watts per meter squared at the top of the atmosphere. So these light bulbs are about 100 watts per meter squared. So that's about the, the range in variation that we would see over, say, 10,000 years, you know, a short period. So we get that much change in variation and radiation at the top of the atmosphere. This is for uh, 65 degrees north, which just happens to be about where Fairbanks is. But, uh, so anyway, if we, uh, if we take this, this plot of, of uh, variation and radiation and we overlay it over the last plot, we can see that it just nails, it just nails these uh, interglacials. These peaks in radiation absolutely are driving these interglacial periods. And so that, that gives us confidence. That is what's driving the big interglacials, but the, 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 there's many more questions that actually come out of this. One, I guess the primary is why? Why are we getting these big peaks in radiation and essentially seeing no response or a very subdued response in temperature? What is, the, uh, what is the process that's missing? Why is it some years, some events, we have these tremendous interglacial periods and other events we don't? And the other thing that's, that's, uh, that's very important about this plot is that we can see, I'm sorry, I, reduced, I, redu I reversed the scale here, so I, re I reversed the axis here. So, right, so this is the uh, present time. So we can see that uh, the last peak in radiation occurred about about 9,000 years ago, and so it's been decreasing ever since then, while our temperatures for the last 10,000 years have been remarkably stable. And that in itself actually brings um, a huge question. That's probably more important than why is the planet warming now, is why has it not been cooling for the last 10,000 years? This is a plot of the uh, of the changes in, uh, in temperature. This is uh, November through April, so it's primarily wintertime temperatures, and it's a difference between now, the last decade, and the previous period of uh, the previous climatology of 1951 to 1980. And we can see that, as, we, as most of us in this room already know, that most of the warming is occurring in the, uh, in the high latitude regions. So we're seeing tremendous warming in Alaska and tremendous warming in, in central Siberia. And this is... Um, a plot of the changes in, in temperatures that we've actually witnessed in Alaska in the, last, uh, in the last 50 years. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of warming all across Alaska. The average, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is in Fahrenheit, the average uh, increase in temperature in the state of Alaska has been about 3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 1.7 degrees Celsius. So we, we see that, uh, that this warming is going on all across Alaska, but we're seeing uh, less warming in the southern parts and greater warming in the northern parts, as we expect. Now, the, uh, the consequence of warming is, is dramatic throughout the planet, but it's, it's, it's even more of a factor for us in the northern regions, in Canada, Siberia. 
We are not just seeing warming, we're also seeing thawing, melting and thawing, and the structural changes that come with that. So this is, and this is the projection of the, uh, of the increase in changes that we, will, we expect to see over the next, next uh, 50 years, or next 100 years, I'm sorry. So the, uh, the changes are, again, most pronounced in the northern regions. Now the consequence of this plot is that essentially what this will do is this will take our entire state to above freezing, to above thawing. So we will see massive thawing and, and melting throughout the state and with the associated changes in the structure in the, in the uh, ground surface that will accompany that. And I wanted to show this plot too as far as to, to see the, uh, the variations that we we're, must deal with going across, across time. So we, we expect to see a gradual warming with the increasing uh, greenhouse gases, but we don't see continuous trends and increases. We see um, warming and cooling. We see uh, for the last decade, essentially, we've had a, a period of, of sustained, um, essentially the same, uh, very, not much change in the last decade as far as the temperatures go in both the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. Although the last decade has been the warmest in the last hundred years, we're not seeing a lot of, of increases lately. The, one of the consequences of this is that our society is, is our, the people in, uh, in government, the people who are, are making the decisions, are, are being convinced or being informed that the climate is no longer warming. And the, the important part of this is that we really need to be able to predict what these, these ups and downs are. Although we will, may tend to see a continued increase in temperatures, we are going to see warming and cooling periods. And it's really important that we that we are able to predict these downturns, that we are able to predict and explain why we're getting cooling periods, and to be able to project those into the future. This is a, uh, a plot of the expected changes in precipitation for the Arctic regions. And we can see that in the uh, next 100 years, we do expect to see increases in precipitation, precipitation throughout the year, but more increases in the wintertime than in the summertime. These this is consistent across most models. Most of the GCM models do predict increases in precipitation. But from my perspective, the increases in precipitation don't necessarily mean increasing, increased wetness. Um, other models do predict increases in storm events too, as far as we expect to see increases in precipitation, but also increases in storminess, increases in, in extreme events. But as I was saying, the uh, ecological experts from around the world have been arguing about whether this increase in precipitation will also cause increases in wetness. And unfortunately, this is, this is about where we are right now, in that although we do expect to see increase in precipitation, we can't necessarily say that it's going to be increased, it's going to be wetter. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And this is, this is a hugely important question in terms of feedbacks. The uh, soil moisture is, is a dominant influence in the latent heat flux, as, as most of you know, the sensible heat flux, the conductive heat flux, but it also really strongly controls the carbon and methane emissions. As we expect the, uh, in general, in a very broad overview, in general, as, as the permafrost warms, as, the, uh, as permafrost thaws, we see the uh, increasing uh, decomposition. As the soils get warmer and drier, we expect to see more aerobic decomposition and increased CO2 flux. As the soils get warmer and wetter, we would expect to see uh, increased anaerobic decomposition and increased methane fluxes. The other thing that uh, soil moisture plays a dominant role in is in the ecosystem processes, such as the uh, changes in vegetation. And I'll come back to that again. So I'm just going to touch on a few of the other uh, processes that we've observed in the, the, uh, the changes in uh, and some of the hydrology. So this is some, some of, from some of the work that Kenji Yoshikawa did on the uh, Seward Peninsula near Nome and near, uh, near Council. When he noticed that the, uh, in the area where we were working that many of the lakes in that area were shrinking. And he, uh, he looked at uh, 23 lakes in that area and of those 23 lakes, 21 of them had, uh, had shrunk in area of water over the previous uh, 50 years. 
And of the, of the two that did not shrink, that did not get smaller, the surface elevation of the water, of the pond, of the lake, was at the same elevation as the groundwater. In those two lakes, I'm sorry, in the 23 lakes that did shrink, the pond elevation was above or at a greater elevation than the groundwater levels. Of those two lakes that did not shrink, the pond elevation was at the same elevation as the groundwater. We did some, uh, some geophysics, some ground penetrating radar, and put in some boreholes, and we discovered that below these lakes there was a talik or a talik. That is a zone of, of unfrozen soil within the permafrost. And essentially what that talik had allowed is that it, it allowed a connection from the lake through the permafrost and allowed a mechanism, allowed a pathway for those lakes to drain. And essentially what, that hap what happens is that as the, uh, as the soil is thawed with the gradually warming, the active layer, that is the, the zone or the soil above the permafrost that freezes and thaws every year, the active layer got thicker and thicker and the uh, soils actually gradually begin to drain and dry until if, if eventually a zone completely thawed through that allowed the, uh, the perched pond, we call the, the uh, ponds or lakes that are above the per permafrost to be perched until that perched lake was able actually to drain to the underlying groundwater. And so those ponds shrunk. So the permafrost exerts the dominant influence on the hydrology and ecology in the Arctic regions. And so the changes in permafrost essentially really do have a, essentially a cascading effect. As we see changes in permafrost, then we can, we can see the responses in the hydrology, see the responses in the ecosystem, see the responses in the local surface uh, energy balance. And as, that, as those changes occur over larger areas, then eventually they become uh, regional effects and eventually uh, may indeed have uh, global impacts on the climate. The Many people think that uh, the permafrost is so thick that it would take centuries to thaw out and so centuries to have an impact, but and that is true, the permafrost is very thick in, in many areas, but effectively we only need to thaw out an area of soil um, that is thick enough so it doesn't refreeze the following winter. So this is some, from some work that we did on, uh, with, re with respect to fire, in that we looked at, uh, when we had a fire, we would see an immediate uh, change in the, uh, in the active layer, and it would get thicker and thicker for several years. And after about 10 years, what happened is a talic would form, a talik would form, and at that point, then the soils could continue to drain throughout the winter. And as soon as it, they were able to drain throughout the winter, then the soils above it became drier. And that drying continued until the, uh, would continue until the, the talic would refreeze. And the talic would refreeze as the organics accumulated at the surface and as the vegetation recovered. So if the, uh, if the talic would refreeze and the uh, soils would become wet again, eventually the, uh, the deciduous trees that came in after the fire would be replaced by the coniferous trees. But what we're seeing now in some of the lower areas, the lower elevations in Alaska, is that these taliks are not recovering. These, these taliks are not refreezing. And so the soils are becoming much drier. The vegetation is not recovering to the, uh, to the, the uh, previous predominant vegetation. So these, these deciduous trees are remaining. So effectively, what we're seeing is, is a change in trajectory of the previous climax vegetation types. And so these fires cause a dramatic immediate response to a climate change that essentially does not recover again. This is from some work, some, some really excellent work that uh, Larry Smith did in, uh, in Siberia. And this shows, again, shows that uh, changes in lakes, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a brilliant analysis in that it, it covers a very large area. So um, let's see, it goes about, I think about, uh, from, let's see, about 60, 60 degrees up to 68 degrees. So that's about uh, 400 miles, I guess. And so what this, this covers a very large range in, in permafrost. So the uh, area in the north is the cold permafrost, and the area in the uh, center is the, uh, the warmer discontinuous permafrost. And the area in the south, in the pink, is the, uh, is the sporadic permafrost. And what Larry was able to show is that in these cold areas in the north, where we have um, 
the cold continuous permafrost, there was an increase in the number and the area of lake. So these bars here, the uh, yellow represents the lake count, the total number of lakes. The orange represents the total lake area. And these cold northern areas, the lake count and the lake number increased. Whereas in the southern areas, the, the discontinuous permafrost and the sporadic permafrost, he showed that the, uh, that the lake numbers and the lake areas all decreased. And these are dramatic changes. So this is on the order of 10% all across this large area. Now effectively, this is essentially what we believe is the same mechanism that was occurring in the, in the lakes areas that I showed before. In that as the permafrost is degrading, these, area, these lakes in the, uh, in the south can allow infiltration to the groundwater and can allow shrinkage of the lakes and decrease in the total number of lakes. Whereas these lakes that are farther up north, the permafrost is too thick there to allow the, the infiltration, to allow the complete drainage. So essentially what's happening up here, these, these permafrost, these areas up here are very ice rich. As this permafrost is degrading, we're getting subsidence at the surface and essentially a new lakes are forming. So we're getting increased numbers and size of lakes. So essentially it's the same mechanism that's occurring as we saw on, this, on the Seward Peninsula and it's the same process occurring all across Siberia in the north and the south. But in the south we're seeing loss of lakes and in the north we're seeing increase in lakes. As time goes on, as this permafrost um, thaws more and more, we may expect to see, uh, see that reverse, that this process changed as far as not the process but the pattern changed. We may expect to see eventually these lakes being lost too. Unfortunately, this is, this, is, uh, this is hugely important for us, not just from the climatology perspective, because it will have a climate impact. We will see a change in the surface energy balance, but it also impacts the, uh, the migratory waterfowl. It also affects uh, local indigenous people. And we're seeing this, this process occurring all across Canada and across Alaska. So this is, this is a real change that's occurring on large scales. The, uh, the change, the, the change in hydrology is not always um, the water, let's see, as the permafrost degrades, we don't always see the groundwater downwelling. In many places we see the uh, groundwater upwelling. So this is a spring and an example of a place where we get groundwater upwelling. And as permafrost degrades in some places, we can, we can see that also occurring. So in many places the permafrost constrains the groundwater levels. And so as we, if we drilled a well through the uh, groundwater, we would have an artesian well. That is, the groundwater gradient is upward, and so we would see the uh, increase in flow. And so as we, in some areas where the permafrost degrades, we don't actually see the drying and the shrinkage of lakes. We actually see the inundation of the surface. So as the, as the permafrost degrades, as the surface subsides a bit, the groundwater can percolate upwards more and we can see inundation. And this is, uh, this is uh, in the Tanana Flats, but this can occur in, in many areas where the groundwater gradient is upward. And those typically occur in areas where we have large wetlands. Again, this is, this is hugely significant because these areas, these are tremendous sources of peat, tremendous sources of carbon. As we get inundation of these, these wetlands, then we will get uh, dramatic increases in the, uh, in the methane fluxes. Again, this is, this is kind of following up on that same point. In, in uh, much of interior Alaska, much of interior Canada, much of, uh, of uh, southern Siberia, we have discontinuous permafrost. That is, we see the permafrost, this, the blue color represents permafrost here. We see permafrost on the north slopes, and we see permafrost free on the south slopes. And we see um, huge differences in the... Uh, like I said, huge differences in the local ecology, huge differences in the surface energy balance just based upon the presence or absence of permafrost. Where we have permafrost, we have cold, wet soils. We have cold, wet soils, we have large peat accumulations. There's low, low decomposition of the organics so that the carbon accumulates for, uh, for many, many centuries. Uh, where the permafrost is absent, we get infiltration of the groundwater, the soils are much drier, and so the duff layers are much thinner. And so we, we can more or less project what type of changes we may expect to see as that permafrost degrades. So we will expect to see uh, increased decompositions of the organics. We expect to see changes in the, uh, 
in the base flow, we'll get more infiltration of the water to the groundwater, and so we'll have more stable base flow. On these areas that are in, in permafrost-dominated watersheds, we see very flashy responses, and so we will see uh, uh, dramatic and insignificant changes in the local hydrology. Um, this is just uh, an example from uh, some work from, from Bob Bolton showing the changes in the hydrograph of these, uh, of these watersheds. So for a low permafrost watershed, these are all on, uh, on the same scale, specific discharge. So at a low permafrost watershed, we see a, a fairly significant amount of base flow throughout the, throughout the, uh, throughout the summer. But in these areas that are dominated by, by permafrost, we see almost zero base flow, but we see very flashy responses to storm events. These, these watersheds are all very close to each other. And so we can kind of project how that will, how that will change, how our water, watershed responses will change with degradation of permafrost. I think I'll skip over some of these. Um, I also want to talk about some of the changes that we see in, in the uh, vegetation. So this is from some work that, uh, that Matthew Sturm did with uh, Ken Tape and Chuck Racine, and it showed a, a significant increase in, in shrubs over the last... Uh, oh, excuse me, I've got to get my poster. So, um, so the shrubs have really increased uh, dramatically across, across Alaska, and also there's similar work has been done in Siberia and Canada and shown the same thing. Uh, Andy Lloyd has shown that 2.3% uh, that of the tundra area in Alaska has been colonized by trees. Now the uh, important consequence of that is that the uh, forest, essentially, the forest and the tundra absorb about the same amount of solar radiation in the summertime, about 80, this forest absorbs about 90%, uh, tundra absorbs about 80%, but in the wintertime, forests absorb much more solar radiation. So this is, this again, is a change in albedo with, with a dramatic feedback effect to, to cause warming of the, uh, of the local climate. This is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, relationship between the uh, permafrost and the vegetation. So this is a thermokarst. Again, a thermokarst is an area where we get uh, uh, subsidence of the surface due to degradation of the permafrost, melting of the massive ice that's buried, that's, uh, buried there. As we get these uh, thermokarsts forming, essentially what happens is it's, it's become saturated in the center but drier on the edges, and that gives this vegetation, the, the shrub-type vegetation, the opportunity to get started there, and that expands outward from those, those thermokarsts. And so these, there is a, a very tight coupling of the permafrost degradation, the changes in hydrology, and then the changes in the vegetation, which, again, over large areas will have effects on the, uh, on the regional surface energy balance. And I think I'm going to bounce on here quickly. So the, uh, the important consequences of this are that a doubling of CO2 is expected to have about uh, an effect of about 4.4 watts per meter squared. However, this is from some work that uh, Eugeni Euskarkin did with Dave McGuire, and they showed that, the, uh, that in, the, in the next 100 years, the changes that we can expect to see from changes in snowmelt, that is, earlier snowmelt and later snow return, and the changes in biomass actually add up to almost an equivalent effect to the, uh, to the changes in CO2. So we can get about 4 watts per meter squared changes in CO2, I'm sorry, 4 watts per meter squared of warming just due to these changes in snowmelt and biomass. And finally, I want to come back to the, uh, to the point I was trying to make earlier about how the, uh, although the uh, models, the GCM models are predicting uh, increases in precipitation, that does not necessarily lead to an increase in wetness. I, I, have demonstrated, I think, that uh, with the degradation of permafrost, we will see, for the most part, we will see drying at the surface that will occur over very large areas. This is from some, some, some really nice work from Mark Serez, and I, I, I've used this, this plot a lot. What this shows, actually, is that, so Mark did this work in, the, in Siberia, and it shows that in the, uh, in the summer, in, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the winter periods, most of the precipitation, this is the uh, convergence over, over uh, uh, precipitation plus tendency. So in the, uh, 
in the winter time, most of the precipitation that occurs in the Arctic regions is transported from somewhere else. So it comes from, uh, from lower latitudes. So about 80% comes from, is, uh, from convergence. Whereas in the summer times, about 80% of the precipitation comes from recycled evaporation. So if, our, if we do see degradation of the permafrost, continued degradation of the permafrost, and continued drying at the surface, this evaporation must decrease. And if this evaporation decreases, then we would expect that precipitation also has to decrease. And so I think this is an important component of the uh, GCM models that's really not incorporated correctly at this point. And again, another important feedback mechanism that really needs to be, really needs to be addressed. And so it's, it's really difficult for us to project what the responses, what the environmental responses are going to be, and to help tell our societies what they need to do, how to adapt, if we can't even, at this point, really accurately and confidently predict what the, what the precipitation is going to do. Finally, the uh, one last feedback mechanism I want to talk about is the, uh, is the changes in, in runoff. And so this is, uh, this plot is, is is there's more data that's come out of this now. This is from some work that Bruce Peterson did with, with many colleagues in, in Siberia, and this is from the, Arctic po or the NOAA Arctic report card, and shows that the runoff from the, the big Siberian rivers and North America is, has increased dramatically in the last, uh, last century, mostly North America in, in more recent years, but they've really seen a dramatic increase in the last few years. And the consequences, the consequences of that are going to be, again, several important feedback mechanisms. As we see increased discharge, we will see uh, changes in sea ice, decreases in sea ice. Uh, we'll see changes in the biologic activity. With the changes in biologic activity, we can see increases in uh, fluxes of uh, dimethyl sulfide and, and other gases, which will affect the, the, the amount of clouds. In the wintertime, the increase in clouds will have a, 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 a positive feedback effect. We'll see warming to the surface. In the wintertime, we'll see a negative feedback effect with uh, greater um, reflectance to the, uh, to the surface. But again, these changes in, in hydrology do have broader consequences as far as the number of feedback effects. One of the last things I want to talk about is the, is the permafrost itself. So this is, for those of you who have not worked in the Arctic much, this is very really typical uh, pattern ground, it's called. These, at the intersections of each of these, these polygons, is a very um, massive ice wedge. Um, these ice wedges are formed in the wintertime when uh, these were formed mainly in the, uh, in the late Pleistocene and early Holocene when the ground cooled rapidly. As the ground cooled, we would get contraction of the ground surface and we would get cracking in, in the ground. And when the spring snow melted, that water would run into that crack and form an ice wedge. And over the uh, over the years, over the centuries, these ice wedges grew to, to massive proportions. So they can be uh, on the order of, of one to three or four meters across the top, and they could be uh, uh, tens of meters in depth. Um, the tops of the ice wedge typically occur at the, at the uh, uh, top of the permafrost or the top of the maximum uh, depth of thaw that has occurred in, in, in recent years. As we get uh, some type of disturbance, well, with, such as a, a fire or construction or, or climate change, we see, we see melting of these, these buried massive ice. And depending upon the local topography, we can get uh, formation of, uh, of ponds or streams or, or some other changes in, in surface topography. Um, these, are, these are very important to, to us in Alaska, we're, and we're seeing more and more and more of these thermokarst. If effectively, as these thermocars form, what they can do is they can gather, they can gather water and effect, effectively become new stream channels. And so we can see real-time geomorphology that are occurring in, in, uh, in Alaska with the degradation of permafrost, with su the subsidence of the surface. And with this changes in, in surface topography, again, we see changes in, in soil moisture, changes in drainage, and uh, another feedback mechanism. This is... Uh, a plot that uh, Vladimir Romanovsky gave to me, and it, it again it just kind of displays the uh, the changes in the permafrost structure. So, the uh, 
the uh, near surface temperatures in, around Fairbanks are, are not so cold, five, minus 6 to minus 2 degrees Celsius. But the uh, uh, temperature below the snow is actually pretty warm. It's like 0 to 1 plus the annual temperature, 0 to 3 degrees above, above freezing. And then we have tremendous buildup in the peat below that. Um, below the peat is the active layer, and it is at this point, at the permafrost table, where we have the most ice-rich conditions, we get the migration of water throughout the summer to the freezing front, and so the massive ice builds up right here. And with that, uh, that thick ice layer, eventually what we get is a, uh, a shear plate, a shear zone. Um, you may or may not know that in 2004 and 2005 we had tremendous fires in Alaska. It was, it was very hot and dry. That same year, those same years, we also had many landslides in Alaska. What would happen is we would get a, a shear zone at the top of the permafrost, so at that 50 centimeters or one meter thick, and that surface we would get uh, perhaps, it would thaw down into that, that shear zone, we'd get some uh, rain or something on the slope, and it's, that surface would slough off and that would expose the, the ice-rich permafrost below it. So that, uh, that uh, landslide occurred in 2004, and this, this image was taken just a year and a half later. And we can see, for scale, there's a person right there. And so you can see the amount of, of erosion and uh, thermal fluvial mechanical erosion that occurred in just one year. So it's no longer a thermocarse. It's called a, a retrogressive thaw slump. So Tremendous amounts of sediment are coming out of these, are coming out of these, uh, these thaw slumps and having big impacts on our rivers. Unfortunately, this is just um, upstream from a, a shefish spawning area, and that the consequence of that is shefish do not spawn in, in muddy waters, and so it had a big impact on that uh, that spawning area on that on that fishery, and it also had uh, big impacts on the village that was just downstream from there because. Following, they had really good water before this, but following that, uh, that thaw slump, they had to change the filters in their, their water treatment system seven times a day. And so it's, uh, these have huge, huge consequences to our society. So from my perspective, this kind of, uh, this kind of sums up our issues in that we've, we, have tremendous, we have a tremendous weighty problem to deal with. And so these are, these are, these are us. These are, the, these are the researchers who are trying to resolve this problem. And none of us can do this alone, but, uh, but together we can, we can figure this out. We can come up with a good understanding of the dynamics of climate change and to be able to develop this predictive capability and, and the ability to help our communities, help our societies understand what the changes are coming and prepare for them. I guess it's one last thing I wanted to say as far as the, uh, the consequences of climate change in, in Alaska aren't, aren't all bad in that this is, this is my old dog team and, and this is my new dog team. <laughs> so, and with, with that, I'll, I'll thank you and I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions there. So you, Richard? Yeah, Larry, thank you. It's beautiful and sobering, unfortunately. How close are we to useful projections of how to store carbon in the Arctic soils? Boy, how to store... Richard Alley just asked, how close are we to useful projections of how to store carbon in the Arctic soils? Boy, you know, the... Uh, uh, Ted Schur did some wonderful work, and he published it in Nature this year. And he showed that the, uh, there are huge, huge, huge reservoirs of carbon in the, uh, in the permafrost. If you consider the deep stores of permafrost, there is actually more, permafrost, more carbon stored in the permafrost than in the, uh, in the whole global atmosphere at this point. I think the importance of the, probably the bigger problem is not in storing more carbon in there, but trying to keep the carbon that's there, there.
Larry? Well, actually, you know, we we can predict where where the uh, where the permafrost is going to degrade. We've we've got a pretty good handle on that. We know how to predict that. But you're right. As far as the importance, I'm sorry, Larry Larry Smith just asked about the the importance of the relationship between the surface water and the groundwater and that interconnections and and what the important research questions are. So we can predict where the permafrost is going to degrade, and the hard part for us, as far as we don't know if the surface is going to get wetter or drier, because we can't predict on large scales what the groundwater gradient is. And again, we can't say with confidence where the groundwater is going to come up on just with modeling tools we have at this point. And again, that's still very important because we can't say where, where the CO2 flux is going to increase and where the methane flux is going to increase. And there's a big difference between CO2 and methane.